Welcome to the Minor Consult, where I speak with leaders shaping our world in diverse ways. Today, I'm joined by Marissa Meyer, an accomplished tech executive, entrepreneur, and innovator. A Stanford graduate who specialized in artificial intelligence, Marissa was an early employee at Google, where she made her mark in the design and development of everything from Google Search to Google Maps. In 2012, she became the youngest CEO of a Fortune 500 company when she was appointed to head Yahoo. Following her tenure there, she co-founded the startup Sunshine, which uses AI technology to organize personal contacts and communications. I'm delighted to welcome Marissa to the Minor Consult to discuss her experience at some of the world's biggest technology companies, her leadership insights from big tech, and her assessment of the greatest challenges and opportunities presented by AI. Marissa, welcome, it's great to have you here. Thank you very much for having me. You are a Stanford graduate. As an undergraduate, you majored in symbolic systems, which is an interdisciplinary major, bringing together computer science, philosophy, linguistics, cognitive psychology, and then you have your master's in computer science from Stanford as well. And a theme throughout your studies here was AI. And now fast forward to where we are today, how has AI evolved relative to when you first started thinking and studying and really implementing AI in the work you did both as a student and as a technology leader? Well, the history of AI is, is very interesting. It's, it's extremely interesting. It's, you know, there was a kind of a big burst of it in the 60s and 70s, then it kind of regressed into like rule-based systems. Um, and when I was studying it here, there was a lot of work on neural networks, Bayes nets, things like that. And that's obviously now evolved into deep learning, ML networks uh, that are just far more advanced with far more data um, and scale and compute going into them. And I think the most interesting thing that's happened in the last, say, six to eight months is the real burst in generative AI. When I talk about symbolic systems, I talk about it, you know, it's kind of, it feels like it's kind of an interesting hodgepodge, but it actually knit together uh, in, a, in a perfect way, which is it's got cognitive psychology, how do people learn, philosophy, how do they reason, logic, um, and linguistics, how do they express themselves um, and use language to do that, and then computer science, can you make a piece of technology that can learn, reason, and express itself? And so for a long time in AI, people were very focused on the learning and the logic, right? Could you make the net learn? How would you train it? What were the correctness of the results, the recall of the results, things like that. And what's really happened in generative AI is there's been this real burst in the expressiveness of it. The, you know, the generative AI really comes down to the linguistics part of it. How do you use language to show what it is you know or what it is you have you know, some sort of types of representations to, to be able to, to express what you know. And so um, I think that's really, that was a big surprise to me. Like I always knew that those were important, all, all of them are important components of computer science, but the big burst forward with chat GPT and with Dolly and some of these things is really that expressive language piece that comes after the logic and the learning. Um, and so I think it's been, it's been fascinating to, to watch and to participate in even at the, at the edges. Indeed, and I, and I think as you were saying it, it, the internet was certainly an inflection point in human history. It seems like generative AI is also going to be an inflection point that really changes the way we live our lives, interface with the world, interface with each other. And of course, what we're seeing now in generative AI is language-based generative AI, language-based representational AI. And then the next step will be image-based and then who knows what, what else. Mm -hmm. How do you see all of this converging? And, and how do you think it's gonna impact our lives? And in particular, the way we interface with technology. Sure, uh, I think there's. It's, I think there's almost, you know, I can't think of facets of our lives that aren't going to be touched by AI in some way, and it's one of the reasons why I've been so excited about it yeah. for such a long for such a long time. And I think it's great to really see it starting to have this moment. And I think that moment's going to carry on for for some time. Right now, I actually think that there what we're seeing is language, particularly in English, because you have so much training data on the web. Things have really taken a leap forward. They're starting to make good progress in other languages as well. 
Um, and the visual components, you know, are starting to be quite good where you can tell someone, you know, to, to generate you know, 15 images that look like this or, or perfect or change an image. Um, I think that all of that uh, is going to progress reasonably quickly. When we talk about general intelligence, right, mm -hmm. an overall, uh, you know, general mm -hmm. intelligence agent, I think that's still a good five to ten years away. Okay. And I think that what we're going to see now is really the uprising of a lot of terrific assistant software. Um, where whether you have an assistant in programming, whether you have a, a, you know, a physician assistant that happens yeah, to be right. you know, a computer um, as opposed to a person, I think we're going to see like, a lot of that kind of co-pilot assistant model where there's helpful suggestions, helpful reminders of what you might not have thought of or what you might have missed. Um, and it's still going to be very much in the hands of, of people, in my view, uh, for at least the next few years. Mm -hmm. I think after that is when things get interesting and where we have to be careful. I'm very optimistic of, of where things can go, but I think after that the technologies will start to become powerful enough that we need to realize how much agency do we want to give them to actually sure. effectuate changes in the world as opposed to having those changes be filtered uh, by people. And there's already you know, baby steps in that dar direction. Whenever you're talking about, for example, autonomous uh, driving cars, right, self-driving cars, you're looking at you know, a, a technology that is, of course, taking actions in the world, right? Um, and so th there's going to always be a, a progression towards it, but I think that the type of, of general intelligence that's required for, for true autonomy is still a few years away for most tasks. You mentioned that one of the <clears throat> areas of focus in symbolic systems is studying how we learn. How is generative AI going to impact the way we educate and the way we learn? If, if for example, you know, in, in, in medicine uh, now, with generative AI, we can type in, we can ask a query that has seemingly disparate topics, but generative AI is able to look at the relation among those topics, which is particularly important if we're dealing with, um, uh, if we're treating a patient that has a constellation of symptoms and signs that each individually maybe is somewhat common, but when you group them together, it becomes very uncommon. And all of a sudden we have relationships that you could have discerned by doing a literature search that might have taken a day, but now it takes maybe you know, 30 seconds. So how will it impact the way we teach and the way we learn, particularly in areas that are more knowledge-based, say in history and, and topics like that? Uh, well, a couple of observations. I am really bullish on where I, AI is going. That said, I think there's some things that the current generative AI does very well. So there's some things that it does laughably badly. And like I think the more expertise you have in a subject, sometimes the easier it is to critique what it comes back with sure. in that particular topic. So I, I definitely think that right now there still needs to be some guidance. And I still think there's a lot of room for humans to see things that the computer still can't, right? Especially in some of these like esoteric medical areas where you're like, this condition just hasn't presented before. Uh, I do feel for education. I think education in general broadly is going to be one of the areas that's most impacted. I felt for like, I'm sure I heard it was true. I, obviously not being a college student myself, I'm not sure. Um, but I mean, I felt for it with ChatGPT coming out last November, you know, I think that there was all kinds of questions at, in academic in, institutions around the world of, you know, someone used generative AI to write that final term paper that was sure. due in December, <laughs> right? Yes, like, yes, yes. you know, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Because you have the, the, the obvious question you know, there's all the questions of how we learn, what it means to learn knowledge versus facts versus actual intelligence. Um, but there's just also the fact that you're like, well, wait, they didn't actually write it. A computer wrote it for them and they haven't absorbed the knowledge and actually like had that right. depth of connection and understanding. But at the same time, in terms of the future skill set needed, being able to operate these things effectively to get insights and express them this way is absolutely going to be required of the future skill set of those students. And so, you know, I think trying to find that balance. Um, I always, you know, in the early days of Google, people had a lot of concerns, right? I still remember, I think it was The Atlantic um, came out with a cover that said it is Google making us stupid with the, like, mm -hmm. the double O's. It was this kind of like iconic cover. And I have to say, I never felt that way. I always felt that, sure. you know, there was the rote memorization of facts and then there was the actual intelligence of how do you reason, how do you learn. In fact, 
you know, it's funny because it was actually, when I think about it, it was a medical doctor that actually led me into symbolic systems. Um, when I was a, between my uh, high school and college years after senior year, I went to the National Youth Science Camp. They bring back all these brilliant alumni, and there was a, um, a doctor who came from Yale, Dr. Zun Wynn. Okay. And I love it because actually, it was because his first name was Zoon, almost everything you say about him sounds like a proverb. Um, <laughs> but, um, and he was just brilliant. And so among a, lo a lot of these, you know, a lot of brilliant students there, um, he just fascinated us, you know, and he would give us all these puzzles and riddles. Like if a person walked like this, what muscle has to have been right, impacted, right. right? And like, so we'd all spend the whole, you'd see like hundred kids, two from each state, like all walking that way all day, trying to figure sure. out what muscle we weren't engaging. Um, really, really brilliant. And there was one day when a bunch of campers were all sitting around and we were just talking about how brilliant Zoom was. And it, I think it hurt the ego of one of our counselors <laughs> <laughs> who said, you know, you know, you know, you guys, you have it all wrong. And we said, really? And he said, you know, it's not what Zoom knows, it's how Zoom thinks. Yeah. It's yeah. not necessarily the facts that he's remembered. Sure. It's the fact that you could drop Zoom into a foreign country, a foreign subject, right? And within a few minutes, he'd be asking the right questions, drawing the right conclusions, putting together the right types of connections. So to me, when everyone was saying, oh, you know, you can look everything up on Google, you don't have to learn anything, it's going to make us all really stupid, I was like, no, I think the fact that you can retrieve facts and not kind of waste that brain space sure. on it, yet still be able to engage a lot of reasoning powers, I think that's still really powerful. I think with AI, obviously, it's, it's going to take now more, more muscle and more determination over the long haul, not immediately, but over the, the long haul to make sure that people are really still, you know, learning, you know, some of the basic ways that you want to be able to reason and, and figure things out. Exactly. So if we go back to the early days of Google, you were employee, I think, number 20 at mm -hmm. Google, mm -hmm. and um, you helped build the company from scratch and had a major part in, in Google's rapid ascent to dominate search and so many other areas. What was it like uh, being in a, in a company that was growing enormously, uh, taking on bigger and bigger challenges um, with lots of new ideas, but also with a lot of need for execution and focus as, as things scaled? Can you walk us through those years at Google and how you grew as the company grew and how you helped and, and drove the, the growth of the company? Well, there was a great team there. So I was, you know, I was part of it, but there were, you know, the entire early team of Google, everyone brought something to the table. And I, I mean, I think that Larry and Sergey are remarkable leaders and visionaries. I think some of the first people they brought, I still am hard pressed to find someone who I think is smarter and or a better coder than Craig Silverstein, who was their first hire. Um, and there were just a lot of terrific people, um, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and so I, uh, Urs Hotze, who's a PhD from Stanford, uh, was, our, was my first boss uh, as the VP of engineering and is still there today leading a large part of technology. So there's a lot of really terrific people who were there at Google in the early years. And I have to say, um, it was exciting, it was intense, it was incredibly demanding. And I think that uh, we had the right leaderships and the right insights at the right time in terms of making the right decisions in terms of what to focus on, what deals to go after, how to grow, how to evolve the, the search engine in a way that met people's needs. Um, and I think we were all very bullish. We all knew that we were on something that was pretty incredible given the types of sure. orders of magnitude of growth we were seeing very quickly. Um, but I still will say, I think all of us, the, the entire early team, including the founders, have to be surprised at just how big it is. You know, Google is a great example of how consolidation occurs in the, in the tech industry. Do you think that there will be similar consolidation around generative AI in terms of a dominant, uh, a clearly dominant leader, or is it going to be more, more dispersed? I think it will be slightly more dispersed. I think that there's a couple of factors that come into play. One, these models are very expensive to build. Mm -hmm. yep. Right, they're building $100 million models right now. Uh, I know of a few companies that are planning billion dollar models. Yep. And they, they're, right now they're planning and working on the billion dollar model, but the $10 billion model isn't too far behind. So in terms of pools of capital that can fund this kind of learning, you know, it's more than just one, 
but it's not a hundred right. either, right? We're not going to build a hundred ten billion dollar models. I don't, I don't, I don't think. Maybe we will over time, but certainly not present day. Um, and you need a fair amount of, of expertise and specialization to be able to actually successfully build a model of that size. So um, I don't think it will be infinite. I do think that there's room for half a dozen to a dozen players. Mm -hmm. uh, and I subscribe to the theory that what we'll see is the, the knowledge, the type of reasoning they can do in the background um, will be largely commoditized. There'll be a lot of things that are the same, which by the way, was the tr it was true of search too, uh -huh. right? Like something like I would do, we would do different analysis and somewhere between 95 to 97% of queries it would have the same first result on Google and other places, or the results would be 97% the same. It's that last 3%, which it turns out, you know, that's, you know, a lot of people do 30 searches a day. And if one search out of that 30 is markedly better, that builds a lot of staying power, sticking power, confidence in your tool. Right, right? If you think of it right. as like a medical tool where you're like, wait, 3% sure. of the time I get a markedly better outcome. You might say, well, it's only 3%, but that starts to really add up um, sure. over time. And so I do think that like, they'll be largely commoditized, and then there'll be the personalities that interact with you. Because mm -hmm. more and more, as these uh, technologies suggest writing for us, mm -hmm. suggest how we are going to express ourselves, represent us into the world, you're going to want to feel really comfortable with the way this AI talks to you, the way sure. it talks on your behalf uh, and interacts. And so I think over time, you're, what you'll see is um, an evolution towards, you know, people will be like, oh, like, I like Google's agent. Oh, I like Microsoft's agent. Like, oh, I like, you know, ChatGPT or like, you know, some of these other agents where they'll be like, this, I like the way that this assistant assists me and I like the way that this, you know, technology interacts with me and on my behalf. Right, right. And then in 2012, you moved from Google to Yahoo, and uh, Google, you were involved in building the company from the very, very earliest stages, employee number 20, moved to Yahoo, which was already an established uh, company. Can you talk about that transition and uh, talk about your, your years at Yahoo and, and looking back on them, um, you know, what you're, you're most proud of in terms of uh, Yahoo's expansion, its activities, um, and what you learned from your experiences at Yahoo. Sure. Um, well, there's a couple of things I learned about myself in, in and right before that transition. One is that I really loved learning. Yeah. I had done, I had led Google search from the product development side for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. And then I had always had Google Maps in my purview, but I went over and managed the product side as well as the engineering marketing side, basically managed it as a business unit. I moved over to Google Maps. Mm -hmm. And that process really awakened me to how much I hadn't been necessarily learning in search. I had done it for so long. I right. knew where it was going. We were leading the field and like coming up with features and ideas of what was getting implemented and what was shaping it that it was fun and it was exciting and you know, prob it was prob probably much more productive, but taking a step over to really focus on maps and wondering like, why does aerial imagery in Sweden cost so much more than it does in Norway? <laughs> has to do with cloud cover. Things okay. like that that you just okay. learn, right? Yeah, like, yeah, sure. You know, and you're like, I was, just, I was like, wow, I'm just learning so much more each day being in this new domain, taking obviously knowledge that I'd already learned and things that I'd been working on kind of on the side for some time that I was like, wow, like I really, I love being a student, I love learning things, I wanna learn more. And the other thing is, you know, I had children relatively late. My first child was born at Stanford Hospital in, in 30, when I was 37 years old. Um, and be having children relatively late, I remember having this kind of conversation with my mom where she talked about, you know, there's times where people will say, oh, that was my favorite age of my children. And as a mother, yeah. she was just like, you know, I always felt bad for those people because, you know, if you really love, four-year-olds, or you really have seven-year-olds, eventually you have a five or an eight-year-old, and that moment has passed. And she said, I just have to say, I loved all phases of my children. She's like, yeah. everyone was better than the last. And I have to say, as a mother, I feel the same. But I have to say, as a businesswoman, I realized in that conversation, because I hadn't had children yet, I was like, you know, I love all phases of companies. Yeah. I interviewed at Google when they were just seven people. The eighth person joined the morning of my second interview. Okay. Um, so I love it when it's single, like single digits. I love it when it's double digits. I love it when it's hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands. Mm -hmm. I love being an individual contributor. I like managing. I like seeing companies in rapid growth. I love seeing companies in inflection points. 
I even love seeing whether or not you can turn around a company, which is where Yahoo was. Yahoo was a company right. that was in decline. We were trying to see, can we actually get it to grow again? Um, but I realized just like, you know, some parents enjoy every phase of, of childhood. I enjoy every phase of companies. And so when the Yahoo role was presented to me, I have to say at the time they came to me, I was 24 weeks pregnant. Uh, with my first child, and I was already planning. I was planning on launching Google Maps on iOS, uh, like yeah, uh, sure. right, like um, app, we were in a big, locked in a big battling competition with Apple around uh, Apple Maps. We sure. knew that was coming in September. We were trying to get Google Maps on iOS um, uh, out in October. I had my maternity leave planned, and then there was this opportunity to go to Yahoo, which was a company. You know, in the early days of Google, we aspired. Sure. To be like Yahoo, we were thrilled, right? The biggest party we ever had at the company, even relative to our small size, um, was with the, with the day that we got the, the Yahoo contract. Yes. Uh, and yeah. started powering Yahoo Search. And so it was a company we had always looked up to, always admired. And it was a lot of what I had done, but applied in a new way, right? Yeah. And so yeah. it was search, maps, email, uh, news, all of these different pieces that I had worked on. Um, and I really wanted to see, I wanted to have that learning experience. Sure. And perspectives on, on your time at Yahoo and, and, and mm -hmm. the contributions you made and, and the mm -hmm. impact? Sure. I think that there's, there's a lot of good there. I think that um, we did get parts of the business growing. We grew sure. a new line of the business, you know, we had about a $5 billion business. We grew a $2 billion business from scratch mm -hmm. on mobile there, which was, um, was hard work uh, and a big success. I couldn't be proud of the team that we built because that team, the people there were terrific and what they've gone on to do, what they did there, sure. really, really, really remarkable. Obviously, we wanted to return Yahoo to its greatness. We wanted it to be sure. you know, Google, Facebook, and Yahoo, and that's not the, the outcome that, that we ultimately got. But I do think it's very hard to find like a product when you've already got a base of $5 billion of revenue, right. finding a new product that can replace it yeah. And and deliver the type of growth that consumer technology can on top of that, um, you know that's uh, you know that's very that that's a big challenge. And we I'm proud of how we did. I yeah. wish we could have gotten it to a different outcome. Sure. Um, but overall, I think that the for me a lot of what drives me is the impact on users' lives and the people who like yeah. benefit from the technology. And I think that you know overall the product line was in great shape. I had a great compliment from. Uh, Jerry Yang right at the end of my tenure where he was like, you know, he's like, I just don't think the product line has ever looked better and worked better for people. And That's I think great. that, you know, when you look at it from that perspective and financially it was a big success, largely because of Alibaba, but we got a really good outcome there in terms of, you know, that partnership and just managing that financial stake in a way that really delivered a lot of value. That's wonderful. If we maybe turn to a topic that's on a lot of people's minds today and that is the regulatory impact, the appropriate role of regulation uh, when it comes to tech in general, but in particular as we think about AI, what principles, because this is something you have interacted with, dealt with in your leadership roles, Google, Yahoo, and certainly in your startups as well, what principles are in your mind that should guide society writ large and the government uh, in thinking about the regulation of tech, both now and in the future, given the rapid ascent that we're likely to see in, in generative AI and its impact, as you spoke about before. Uh, yes, well, I think the big, the big first and foremost thing is, I think we have to take a human-centered view, which I was involved with the launching of the HAI Institute right. here, so that's no surprise, but I, I do think Stanford has taken the right view on that, that there's a lot of ways that this technology could go, but I think if we put humans at the center of the decision making in terms of what is ethical, what should be pursued, how do we pursue it, how do we actually make people's lives better with it, I think that human-centered view is probably the, the largest and overriding principle. Um, in terms of the regulation, I think it's going to be very challenging. Yeah. I think even the experts in this space have a hard time thinking about what's going to happen in two to three years and how do you protect against very bad outcomes and, and ensure you know, good to great outcomes. Uh, I think it's hard because it's just moving so fast. Uh, I think it's, and, and those are the experts in the field. So now if you start to talk about 
regulators, lawmakers that are regulating lots of industries, right? It's very hard to say, okay, what should you do today that, you know, that is going to be the right type of governance right. and regulation for this technology um, two or three years from now. And right now, a lot of the focus is on uh, the company's rivalries, Microsoft versus Google. And I think that actually misses the bigger picture is that there's other countries, China in particular, who are going to be developing this technology as rapidly as we are. I think right now we're modestly ahead. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how long that sustains. Um, and they are going to have a very different view in terms of what to build, how to build it, and how to deploy it. Uh, and so I think that we need to be really careful that our regulation and you know even the debate on how to regulate doesn't set us back. Right. 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 Where if we say wait, you know, there's a rule that came into play and it ultimately really curtailed the speed with which these technologies are developing. That could be very bad because it could mean that the human-centered technologies, much of which I would argue that most of the companies in the U.S. are are taking a human-centered view mm -hmm. to this, actually end up being in second place to you know, technologies developed overseas. And so I think that is something to, to approach with some amount of skepticism and caution. That isn't to say no regulation. I have, actually have to say, you know, Google has been subject to different regulatory probes over the years. I was the recipient of some of those questionnaires and had to, had to give various testimony at times. And I will, I will say that I think that type of scrutiny is helpful, yes. right, in the face mm -hmm. of a new technology. It, you know, at the time, I remember being like, oh, you know, it, it definitely feels cumbersome and burdensome, but I think that with this kind of responsibility comes, you know, a certain level of scrutiny that's, that, that makes sense. And uh, so I'm not arguing for no regulation. I'm just arguing that I think that we have to be careful, thoughtful. We have to take a human-centered view and a future view you, you mentioned the human-centered view, and it seems that that's so important also at, at building, or you might say restoring trust of the public in uh, technology in general, but specifically uh, in AI, because as you mentioned, the field is evolving so quickly. How can we, versus an academic institution, as companies, how can we communicate the opportunities and the challenges to the public and engage the public in the type of discourse that's going to be necessary to, to restore trust, which ultimately the regulators are regulators are driven by public sentiment, public opinion, and, and so that's going to be really important, I think, in getting responsible regulation as well. So what are some of the, the things that we should be keeping in mind uh, at restoring and, and sustaining trust in the future? Uh, I think that when people start to see the results of things and they see what they're empowered to do, it sure. changes perspective. People are willing to give up a lot of liberties or a lot of freedoms in exchange for you know, great, you know, great opportunity. Uh, and I think we've seen this historically on the stage. It's interesting, if you go back to the, I think it was the early 1920s, uh, when they rolled out social security numbers, literally there's lots and lots of articles saying, you know, this might be used as an identifier, right, right to actually identify you. Um, right. And th there were absolutely like treatises written reassuring people that no, this will never be used as a unique identifier for you as a person. Right, right, right. Okay? right, <laughs> right, right. Like, and like, and now you just laugh, like that's just absurd. Like, of course that's sure. what it would be used for and it's actually quite useful. Right, right, right. Like right. getting access to social security, being able to be like accountable for your taxes in the right way, like all of those types of things. Right, being able to make income, all of that is extremely useful. And, right. and a social security number unlocks all of that. Same thing with a driver's license. You go, you go, you submit yourself to a test, a driving test, you know, eye test, you know, all of these different things. Yeah. Um, you say where you live, you say your height, your weight, your eye color, your hair color. But being able to drive, people are like, okay, sure, like sure. sign me up, right? Uh, and it was interesting, in a parallel, much smaller, um, at Google, we really wanted to store the queries people had done and the clicks they had done mm -hmm. for as long as possible. We realized that people would probably want it anonymized. No one wants to be able to like, you know, have a company be able to pull up the search they did 20 years ago. Um, so we were doing in some level of anonymization. And it was, I have to say at the time, it was very controversial. You know, some of our competitors realized that we were keeping these logs and they were like, why do you need the logs? And then it became a, it became a big brouhaha. Um, and then we rolled out Google Spellcheck. 
This was like, I think in something like 2000, 2001. And it was the best spell correction anyone had ever seen because it didn't just take rote dictionary words and correct them, right? I remember the classic example we had was um, TurboTax would always get corrected in other search engines to Turbot Ax. Because Turbot isn't Turbot, it's Turbo, it's a French fish, sure. an axe, and right? And so you'd be like, but wait, like something that actually understands the lingo and isn't just working off a dictionary should understand TurboTax is a thing, especially in April. Hmm? Right. Right. And they were like, and it can actually, it was fixing misspellings of names and everything else because what we were seeing was someone would type a query incorrectly, and the next query they would do was that query corrected. Right? Yes. It didn't matter if it was names or brand names or what have you. And then people were like, well, like if you get this kind of spell correction, I can get this kind of accuracy in my search that much faster. And then later we did predictive search and other things using that. That's really useful. So don't keep the logs forever, but you know, keep them for 18 months, anonymize them, write some protections, but it unlocks that. And I think that as we start to look at how AI evolves, that is that kind of early proof points that are needed. Mm -hmm. There's so much more powerful things that Google went on to do with those logs than the spell correction. Sure. But an early, simple, easy to understand, kind of the proof is in the pudding yeah. moment really does cause people to have a lot more confidence and a lot more trust. And I will say that's something that we're working on at Sunshine. I a, we started the company, we joke that we called it Sunshine, but we probably should have called it Mundane AI. <laughs> right? Because we were like, everyone is busy out on the, on the outskirts, okay. driving cars, global facial recognition, things that make people uncomfortable. And you're like, yeah, there's everyday tasks managing your contacts, remembering, you know, important days or, you know, getting prepared for, for, for different things, um, scheduling yeah. that, you know, this t intelligence could, is, would be much better at than humans yeah. are currently. And if you yeah. apply it to some of these everyday problems that are still sticking points for people, people say, oh, like, is this what it can do? I understand. Like, this actually sure. makes my life easier. And it starts to also help them see the trajectory of where it's going and what it might be able to do and might be able to do well and not well. And I think that that actually goes a long way. So I think as we start to see, as people get their hands on the technology and it starts to produce good outcomes that where they're like, okay, I understand how this is going to work. I understand how it's going to help me. And I understand how it's going to affect my daily life. That I think is the example of social security, driver's license, Google spell correction. It all follows that same path. Once you actually can demonstrate, this is what it means for me. Yeah. It starts to give you a lot more trust and confidence in, in overall what's being developed and how it's going. What's your goal for Sunshine? When will people be able to start seeing uh, the effects of what you're innovating at the company and, mm -hmm. and implementing it in their daily technology lives? Well, today we have our first app. We, most of the things that we're interested in have to do with people's relationships. Events, groups, scheduling, and that all starts with contacts. If you look at all those, the different those types of software, you always have to list who's in the group, who's coming to the event, what are your contacts. Um, and so we've started with contact management because I have to say contacts is a problem that's hidden in plain sight. Mm -hmm. I've now talked to thousands of people about their contacts and I haven't met one who's like, I'm good. I'm yeah. totally good. I'm really happy with the state of my contacts. Yeah. So it's something that we've all come to just live with. But yeah you actually can end up with much better contact systems. So it's available in the App Store. It's also available on Android, Sunshine Contacts. And for us, that's the foundation of what we wanted to build because then we can build a lot of interesting things on top of it that ultimately help understand who's a colleague, who's a friend, who are you close to, you know, how do you get in touch with them? And as you start to, we start to build some of these other technologies that, again, are kind of everyday technologies, uh, we have a really great foundation of, of an understanding of how to get in touch with people and why you would want to and how you would want to. That's fantastic. Well, Marissa, this has been a wonderful conversation. I'd like to close with two questions that I ask every guest. First, what are the most important qualities of a leader today? Uh, I think that leaders have to be learners. So you have to be committed to always learning new things. Even, in, you know, we, we, we were, I was joking with some other uh, entrepreneurs that in the pandemic, we all had to become epidemiologists, <laughs> right? Like, sure. right? During the banking crisis last year, we all had to become <laughs> experts in like, the, in like the financial system. And, you know, it's constantly demanding 
the, the increased expertise. You have to be able to talk to your team and about what's happening in the world. And so you have to be more and more general or you have to be really committed to being able to learn something and learn something quickly and really get you, getting your hands around it. So I think learning is incredibly important. I think listening and empathy are, will always be things that are incredibly important to being, to being a strong leader and providing leadership that people really trust. Wonderful. And finally, what makes you optimistic about the future? Uh, I'm, I'm an optimist by nature, but I always just think if you, if you look at you know, how humanity has progressed over time, things just get generally better and better. And it's not necessarily a linear path, but over time, outcomes from health to education um, to you know, poverty, ev everything is actually seems to be moving largely in the right direction. Sometimes not fast enough, Right. but generally overall in the right direction. So I overall am, am a believer in innovation and technology and just so the overall progress that, that humankind has made. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. And thank you for listening to The Minor Consult with me, Stanford School of Medicine, Dean Lloyd Minor. I hope you enjoyed today's discussion with tech executive, entrepreneur, and innovator, Marissa Meyer. Please send your questions by email to theminorconsult at theminorconsult.com and check out our website, theminorconsult.com, for updates, episodes, and more. To get the latest episodes of The Minor Consult, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please rate the podcast five stars. Your feedback helps make this podcast happen. Thank you so much for joining me today. I look forward to our next episode. Until then, stay safe, stay well, and be kind.